Hello, welcome and welcome back. This is Jacob and today we are gonna be continuing the narration and character voice acting for the main story of Ark Knights. Episode 13, aka chapter 13, the Whirlpool, that is passion. Alright, considering this is part 2, the usual things will apply here at the beginning. Uh, but before we do so, for anybody who is both new to the channel and to this narration, bumping into it through this very episode, especially if you're new to Arknets, I would recommend just check on episode 1 for this current chapter of Arknets, the very previous video before this one. Playlist can be found down in the description of the video, and you will get a very detailed explanation at the beginning. Uh, again, sorry for, for anybody else that was that long, but a very detailed explanation as to how to main story Arknights and what is connected to it. So, uh, hopefully it is insightful enough and uh, <laughs> enjoyable enough. But yeah, thank you very much. And also, uh, for anybody else, thank you very much for all the likes, comments and holy hell the views on episode 1 or at a part 1 for this current episode of the main story because um, I'm bringing this up because main story parts don't usually pop off that crazily on the channel. And yes, say close to 600 views and close to 60 likes might not sound like much. It does sound a lot. It is a lot for this channel. And uh, especially because, to put it into perspective, the only other thing, the only other series, rather, that went crazy with uh, both views and likes on this channel is literally, is literally uh, Lone Trail a couple of months ago. Everything else does does its own thing in, in maybe an entire week <laughs> or maybe two weeks, but, um, like, reaching those numbers and stuff like that. But uh, this is wild, so... Uh, Guys, thank you very much. That is helping a lot. So yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, anyway, sorry. We will now do the usual recap. For those of you who want to skip the recap, the timestamps are below as always. And then we will proceed into today's part. So, let's begin with the usual. On the previous part, we began the chapter with... A hop and skip through different countries and through different NPCs discussing certain events that seem to all be linking together, but all in order. We began with Horder doing a narration through his newest book, apparently, that he is currently writing, uh, portrayed throughout that entire first cutscene, continued on to a group of two Sarkas who are literally just cooking soup by burning books in some apparently noble Londinianers, probably, abode. Uh, and they're literally just discussing books. It is a very funny thing to look at, but also, well, the reality of things. Hopping off to Casimir's, we see a discussion between uh, two tabloid reporters as they're discussing their next article, which is supposed to be based on what is going on in Londinium uh, and the Shard, but it gets interrupted by news popping up about uh, Viviana the Candle Knight, and they immediately have other plans. But they also make note that the Sarkas in the area that would usually like uh, have uh, or rather drive taxis have started to disappear all of a sudden. We then hop on to uh, Sargon and our black market over there as two individuals are discussing that essentially weapons, ammunition and supplies are starting to be bought up very, um, very deliberately from the market. Not in large numbers, but in smaller increments but are still quickly disappearing from the market. And it also seems that they're being bought up by none other than Sarkas groups who are uprooting themselves and also leaving. As we later learn, pretty much Sarkas from all across of Terra are uh, coming towards Londinium. We then also hop to another, uh, another place where we see a Trilby Asher uh, corner, cornering a spy. The spy is a... Uh, what seems to be a regular uh, Victorian citizen, but he has been doing some information trading and with none other than Orsus itself. As he is being cornered by the Trilby Asher, he does proclaim that he has no idea about anything when it comes to his uh, contact and stuff like that, but he gets literally obliterated on the spot, melted into nothingness by a black spear that came from none other than an Emperor's guard. Emperor's sword, par pardon. And, uh, yeah, he gone. 
and the Trilby Ash, upon realizing what the hell is happening and who is present, remains steadfast and doesn't even look at the person behind him. Him and the Blade exchange a couple of words, pretty much just making sure that I have not seen you, you have not seen me, we will go each other's way and just report this as is, and continue on. And that is pretty much what happens. Later we hop on to our favorite merc mercenary trio, as W and Ines have retreated Horderer and are currently running away out of out of uh, the outskirts of uh, Londinium and Norport, and are booking it considering they are being pursued by uh, some forces behind them. They do manage to shake them, and we left the scene off with Horderer asking a very peculiar question, as in, if the two girls know any way of killing a lich. We then switch scenes to uh, not a protagonist of this story, or other protagonists of this story, to our reunion buddies who are also around Londinium, collecting uh, their companions and refugees that they can, or rather infected rather, uh, but we begin mostly focused on Guard, as we see him having a dream and being weighted down still and probably forevermore by the lives that have uh, been lost just so, he, not just so he, but also others can live. But in most situations, it was pretty much just so he can keep on going. As he still to this day is being weighted down by the lives of, lives of Ace, Scout and uh, Patriot. But he wakes up and uh, has a brief little discussion with Percival who is there, after which it gets interrupted by the sudden appearance of a group of injured Victorian soldiers who stumble upon the camp. Uh, Nine is there as well. The situation does get uh, solved without any conflict between the two sides, and the Victorian soldiers go away to make their own camp, as they themselves are not just injured, but are heavily infected. On the next day, we see uh, Talula, who is obviously also in camp there, and is handing out porridge to the residents of the camp as we also see that the civilians, uh, the civilian infected that were in the camp with them are all fascinated by Talula and heard stories about her, how she and Reunion have captured a whole city for the infected. But as we also get to notice very quickly, outside of local territory where it happened, people don't really know uh, about the specifics when it comes to what actually happened in Chernobog. And I'm not talking about the whole cachet thing, of course. But the civilians go away, and the uh, guard who is present has a couple of moments to talk to Talula, and they share kind of a very interesting perspective and moment, in which the discussion is pretty much... From Talula's perspective, it is probably very awkward to hear and see guard uh, talk about certain things, because she definitely sees... or in my opinion, at least, definitely sees uh, herself in a, in a couple of years ago when she was in the Tundra uh, getting people together and forming reunion. They do get interrupted by the appearance of uh, one of the Victorian soldiers, exchange food, and after a brief couple of moments later where they also discover one of the um, Victorian soldiers who separated himself into the forest and pretty much exploded in an originium uh, explosion. But yeah, after that, we change venues again. This time, we are on the Duke of Windermere's warship, after the rescue uh, happened at the end of the last chapter, and our people, which means that Siege, Indra, Dagda, Morgan, the Doctor, Amia, and so on and so forth, and a couple of who knows how many civilians have boarded the ship and have left Norpor Borough. We begin the scene with uh, Delphine and her mother talking, and afterwards uh, Delphine would go below deck to see how everybody's doing. She checks on uh, Siege and the rest, but they all get interrupted very quickly as all hell starts breaking loose. Blood starts dropping, drop, dropping from the uh, ceiling of the compartments, and people start literally exploding into blood mist vapor 
as the sanguine arc of the vampires is making his presence known. Delphine uh, separates from the rest of the group as the girls are staying behind to guard the civilians. But Delphine goes upon deck to check on her mother and if everything is okay. Upon reaching the deck, she spots the sanguine arc of the vampires as he descends onto the deck and is being engaged by not just her mother, but her elite guards as well. He's being held back, and Delphine is noticing that something is off about the whole situation. Something doesn't feel right. And upon further inspection and thinking about everything, realizes very quickly that the sanguine arc that is being engaged by her mother and the guards is not the actual one, but a imposter. It is the Damazzi Cluster who has taken form of the Sanguine Arc. But upon shouting out that that is a fake, and the Damazzi revealing himself, the Sanguine Arc, the actual one, is not far behind. He was literally there the entire time as well, and makes his presence known. Now her mother and her guards have to face off not just against one of the royal court, but two of them. But she orders the fiend to go and get to the communication tower of the ship and send out a signal to the uh, ships that are approaching that are part of her fleet. She does run away, but also gets suddenly surprised at one moment as she's helping one of the injured soldiers uh, from the ship, uh, but gets cornered by... Uh, something that appears to be just a hallucination or maybe an illusion created by the Sanguine Arc. A siege runs uh, on top of the deck and yells for Delphine to uh, watch herself. But she does survive. Nothing happens to Delphine, but something again nags at her and something is off. As she runs back to see if her mother is alright, she faces the cruel reality of things. As it seems, there was a bit of hesitation in her mother's reaction. Potentially, by the time when Siege ran on deck and yelled for Delphine, maybe even didn't have to yell for Delphine to watch herself, potentially her mother got distracted for a brief moment, and in that brief moment, she got mortally injured. The Sanguine Arc bids his adieu and goes away. The Damazi stays behind, however, and taunts Delphine with changing into several different forms. One amongst them being Siege, Delphine herself, and then her mother, as he stabs her himself into the chest, shifting back into Delphine's own body, and taunting her even more before death. Upon him actually dying, or rather that copy of him dying there, Delphine has a brief moment in which she can exchange her final farewells with her mother. And... That is where we stopped. So, let us begin today's part. Alright then, so today we are gonna be obviously continuing where we left off, which is the second scene on stage 13-3, continue on to 4, and finish off with 5. And yes, this time around I'm not gonna be stopping at the middle of 5, it will be the entirety of 5. Once we're done with 5, we're gonna check our little booklet up here, and see what unlocked in there, plus we're gonna be picking up Delphine as well from it, uh, because I have not done that yet. <laughs> so we're gonna do that as part of the video, and then see what else unlocked in the little book. Alright, so then, let us continue on 13-3. On the scene after, once again, 13-3 is titled, Not a Moment's Rest, and it says, Until the dust settles, no one can catch their breath. As a quick bonus, uh, before we begin, there was a new enemy that was introduced on 3, uh, one new enemy on 4, and one new enemy on 5. I will be compiling them all into a single stage when I introduce all the enemies at the end of the video, before we go over into our book. So, all of these next stages are gonna be just scene after scene after scene, with just interruption in between the stages. Alright, let's go. You try to present a picture of calm. The crowd is running, there are screams everywhere. They have hardly awakened from the last nightmare before they are put into another great escape. You brace yourself against the wall. Someone ran into you hard. 
Someone pretty darn strong. It all happened so quickly that you had no time to plan. You had expected the worst the moment you failed to stop the first drop of blood from seeping into the curious citizen. Even worse is that you and Amia have become separated by the stampeding crowd. It has been a long time since you last felt alone. Stay calm! Don't panic! The screams drown out your voice. Nobody is listening to your commands. Out of my way! Out of my way! The monsters are coming! Get out of my way! Get away! There's blood on you! Like those monsters! They are not your operators. They are just ordinary people. Reason is a luxury in the face of death. Doctor! Doctor! I'm here! Grab my hand! You finally hear a familiar voice. Amia! Amia tries to force her way through the panicking crowd and reaches out her hand. Grab my hand, Doctor! You know that you are the one whom Amia cares most deeply about. Always. You do not want to disappoint her. You penetrate the crowd and extend your hand with all your strength. You... You're not Amia! You realize who it is standing before you a moment before your hands touch. The Matsi. Why? What should the King of Sarkas look like? <sighs> You're not the one you once were. The myriad souls still reject us. However, a change has occurred. A part of us has left us. We must make a choice. We cannot remain stagnant. The Damatsi approaches you, one step at a time. You can feel that the one-time king of the Sarkas court has changed. He is no longer an idle observer. He has begun moving forward. <clears throat> Doctor! King of Sarkas, I tried to imitate you, but I failed. A new Damatsi. Is this your choice? To formally stand against us? We simply decided to try. Mm. Will we learn our meaning in battle against you, King of Sarkas? Where does our path lead? Once I asked the previous Damatsi what I should do, he said I must overcome all doubt and hesitation. If you still call me the King of Sarkas after being reborn, then go and find the answer yourself. You won't get it from me! She's always at your side, smiling. It almost makes you forget that she is the true King of Sarkas. Dark arts rumble. You find Amia's presence downright imposing. But still, you feel uneasy. Instincts tell you that this was no ordinary attack. In just a short period of time, you have learned that the Duke of Windermere, defender of the frontiers, is no pushover. She had her flagship break off from the fleet in order to save her daughter. This was an opportunity. But the rest of the fleet was not so far away. The tactical advantage in attacking a ducal vessel is limited, unless this was a decapitation operation. No, killing a duke only makes her man angrier. There is more to Theresis's plan. Plus, this ship is home to more than just the duke's elite guards. You and your friends are here. The King of Sarkas is here. Suddenly, a pang of intense pain dazes you. Oh, did I hurt you? 
That Ascalon woman is so annoying. Is she so persistent with everyone? Doctor! Amia disengages from her battle with the Matsi and runs towards you. Arts converge on her fingertips and her crown appears above her head. Look out, Amia! You're the one they're after! The black arts are shattered and a black crown gone. Amia's arts disintegrate in an instant, as though they had never existed. How could this be? It is the power of the King of Sarkas. How? I have long waited to rummage in your emotions and memories, little king. I thought the Revenant would cause you some difficulty, but you seem to be in better condition than I expected. Cautus. No. Chimera. You are no Theresa. An eerie dark halo envelops Amia. She tries to break through, but the Confessarius' cage does not budge. The cage grows smaller. You look for someone who can help, a way to break Amia free. <laughs> the Confessarius guards block an any eyes that dare gaze upon this place. The enemy is more prepared than you thought. Let go of me! You had the fortune to be conferred the crown, but do you truly understand your power? We have studied the King of Sarkars for thousands of years. Amia's struggle grows feeble. The ancient bane arts drain her strength. Her knees buckle, and she falls to the ground. She lifts her hand, but not a ripple of arts answer. As for you... You feel the chilling gaze scanning you. Your heart is beating so fast, it threatens to escape your chest. Anger and despair. Death extends its tendrils towards you. You clutch your fist. Get away from... Doctor! Oh, still mustering the power of the King of Sarkas, even when surrounded by Confessorius witchcraft? I'm starting to miss Liz. Well, this is a benefit to our experiments. I'll spare the doctor's life, for now, and teach you to leverage your emotions. But I must make sure you behave before handing you over to the leader. Great Damazi, that nasty woman is coming. May I continue to deal with the rest? Very well. Maybe she will temper us. You see Ascalon sprinting towards you. Countless Confessarius guards stand in her way. They fall without a sound. Then the figures of countless Damatsi once again bury her. The Confessarius with blue hair lifts Amia in her arms. The whole structure around you shatters. A staircase of earth and stone rises. And a wall of the canyon outside opens its gaping maw. You have seen arts like this before. But she is no gargoyle. Doctor! Amia! Wherever they walk, the stone bridge trembles and shatters, and the cracks on the rock wall heal. Ascalon tries to free herself from the Mazi tide, but the expressionless fragments seem endless. Doctor, stay where you are! The most important thing is... The Confessarius and Amia grow distant. You have heard it many times from many people. You are not built for fighting. So weak, you could not even complete the beginner course for trainee operators. Kalsit wanted you to stay in the rear, 
giving orders in safety. But Kaltzit, equally thin and frail, stood before Theresis. You can still see the gaping wound when you close your eyes. You should wait where you are. Ascalon needs time. You can work on a rescue plan once the battle has concluded. A commander should learn to recognize when the situation is untenable. But... Your ears ring. Amia is your partner, your family. Your sense and sensibility, your past and memories, all cry out. The smiles, the tears, the hard times, the brief joy. The whole breach is right beside you. The stone staircase is starting to fall apart. You put a numb foot forward. Let her go. Let Amia go! You leap before the bridge shatters completely. <sighs> you run like you never have before, as the ground falls out from beneath where you just thread. Your view is obscured by the white vapors that you exhale. Your whole body trembles, you have never so lamented the frailness of your physique. It is not far, you can catch them, you can... There is no time to think. The hole is within reach, but the ever-shifting rock wall could close upon it at any time. A few steps further. You muster all the speed you have. The next instant, you find yourself falling in infinite darkness. How much time has passed? With your portable light, you see that countless hands have emerged from the ground, pulling at the passage, sewing it shut. The space continues to contract, pressing on you. You do not know how far you must go, but you must not stop. Down, down, down. <sighs> Your lungs sting. A light in the distance is your only hope. <sighs> Escaping the contracting hole, you find yourself hanging from an upside-down statue. From its eyes seep water falling from above, gleaming an eerie red in the light of magma. Where... Is this place? Where are these statues? You recognize the statues as Dial. The gargoyle shoulders the roof of the cave, feet burning in the magma. The banshee curls up in the wilted thorns, bone whistle in hand. The Bendigo tries to tear the rock wall apart with twisted hands, frightful visage roaring beneath a mask. The withered vampire extends a hand from the lava. A creature of unknown race holds his head in its hands, stone columns running through its eyes. They look like they could come alive at any moment. Statues of the Sarkas races? You're tough, Doctor. I respect that. You feel a heavy blow, and a pair of baleful eyes. <sighs> Awake! 
How did you follow me with that feeble constitution of yours? I examined your body but found nothing. Well, not exactly nothing. Your structure is... unusual. Different from all these samples I've seen. I would very much like to study you. In great detail. Unfortunately, this place has been abandoned a long time, and the equipment is far from adequate. It would not do to damage such a precious sample. Perhaps I could bring you back to Londinium, but Theresa seems to pay particular attention to you. Amia. You look towards Amia. Her consciousness seems hazy. Black hearts seep out from her, then fade into thin air the next instant. Her brow twitches in pain. She is not in good shape. You have rarely seen this expression on the brave child's face ever since you met in Chernobog. Look, doctor. What is she looking at? She's trembling. What did you do to her? The king of Sarkas grants the promised land. The little bunny simply got a taste of her own power. What do you want? We can talk about it. Meaningless negotiation. Painfully amusing the way you hopelessly grasp at straws. No operator at your side, nothing for you to command. Even the king of Sarkos whom you served is leaving you. What can you do? She draws closer. You tighten the hand hidden behind your back. All you have is a sharp rock that you happen to pick up in the chaos. Your reason tells you that it is useless. Perhaps you would have had a speck of hope if you were Blaze, Ascalon, or even Popcar. You feel regret, but even stronger is your determination. The pain in your hand keeps you conscious. Patience. Wait for her to draw closer. I've asked the leader many times, why does power so often end up in the hands of the ordinary? What have those forgotten king or kings of Sarkas given us beside our life of exile and persecution? Will you, doctor, be one of the causes of another round of suffering? Remove the spell on Amia, and I'll do my best to answer. I appreciate your intelligence, but there has never been a shortage of smart people. There is nothing that can compare to this opportunity, what we have pursued for thousands of years. If she can force the crown upon the head of this little bunny, then it can be forced out. You want to steal Amia's crown? Steal? No, this crown is not a ring lying on the battlefield for the taking. You'll never understand. The blue-haired Confessarius turns towards Amia. This might be your chance. You make the calculations. With your full strength, perhaps. What's this? A rock? You feel your internal organs twitch and convulse. The taste of rust fills your mouth. One little push from the Confessarius and your right hand loses all sensation. Bones have broken. Wincing at the intense pain, you force yourself to lunge forward, but she lightly dodges. You fall in front of Amia, blocking the blue-haired Confessarius' malicious gaze. How touching, putting yourself in front of her, but meaningless. If you're so obsessed, I have a better way to deal with you. Perhaps that brain beneath the hood holds secrets beneficial to our experiments. There. Don't try to resist. Share your memories with me. You can feel the Confessarius' breathing. A numbing sensation filled with ancient witchcraft moves towards the top of your head. Get 
out of my head! What? What could possibly repel Confessarius as... The king of Sarkas? But her mind should have been shackled. A black vortex rises from behind you. Amia whispers at its center. The black crown trembles with agitation. Amia speaking in an ancient Sarkas language. Amia! The shackles of myriad souls are not so easily broken. She remains amidst the myriad souls. She has chosen to protect you subconsciously. Huh. Wait, that's not all. Her connection with the crown is growing? The crown remember souls. Is that Amya's voice? You get a feeling. She's growing more distant by the second to a place that you cannot reach. Amia, wake up! You try to grab Amia, the black vortex roils between you, and a great force tries to push you away. You dig your one good hand into the dirt, dragging the rest of your hide along towards the girl lying on the ground. Ah, such intense emotions. Looks like Theresa's choice was not entirely one of desperation, after all. Just a little further. Why don't we cut straight to the chase, then? I hope this won't break your little head. That would be a shame. The Confessario left more than statues in this cavern. She begins a Sarka's incantation. Amia! You touch her. You promised. Reject the voice! The black vortex shatters and vanishes. You grab Amia's hand. Amia has grown up, but her hands still feel small and frail. Her palm is filled with sweat. You do not know if the Confessarius' curse worked, or if this was the result of Amia's effort and yours. Tch. Blood sprays from the Confessarius' neck. <laughs> Ascalon walks towards you, casting not another glance at the fallen Confessarius. That was reckless, Doctor. If I didn't run into... Look out. Blood explodes and a sanguine shockwave sweeps towards you. A figure stands in front of you, arriving in the nick of time. Vampire arts. What have you done to your bloodline? Hard to imagine that you're related to Shining. The amount of grief that your degeneration has caused that fine girl. <laughs> Lord of the Banshees. I'm impressed. I couldn't have been easy to get here. The Confessarius puts her hand on her neck wound. The blood that sprayed from it is slowly flowing back. I should have been more careful knowing that the sitting Lord of the Banshees is rather rebellious. You're more dangerous than we expected. Urgent situation. Interrogation out of the question. Kill her and leave. I know. You see Logos's cold expression and the incantation that obediently emerges from his tongue. But you do not see Salus's fear, anger, any expression you might expect to see on one facing her own death. You see only curiosity. This is the Lord of Banshees? The Elegaic Court? 
Indeed, these incantations are no less refined than that of your famous mother. But, did you know? Such refined runes, refined arts, they are far from the Sarka's roots. She is backing up. Behind her, the statue of a banshee towers above. Ascalon. An instant before everything went black, you saw Ascalon grab Amia, but Logos shielded you. You saw the statue come to life. You saw the Confessarius's eyes narrow, and saw her ring the death knell first. Doctor, we've left the cave. Ascalon is scouting the area. Your right forearm is broken. I made a makeshift splint, but I'm no medic. What, what about Amia? Still unconscious. The Confessarius said something to the effect of trapped in the myriad souls, but... She's alive, at least. You turn around to see the Cautus girl lying peacefully under a tree, as if she is merely sleeping. I can understand Ascalon's objection to your methods. She's concerned for more than just your safety. But it's also true that you bought us time. The Confessarius and Amia would be behind Londinium's walls by now, if not for your efforts. What of the Confessarius? She got away. Rock and earth, blood, and the wail of the Banshee. Is this the Sarkas that the Confessari want? One so obsessed with bloodline and witchcraft. Their target is the King of Sarkas. We must inform Carlton and Shining. Wait. The vapor around us. This can't be. Careful, Doctor. We may still be inside the enemy's trap. What is it? I don't often see that look on your face. This is not Victoria. This is the Convalis of the Banshees. Well then, crazy things be happening. Now, before we continue on to 13-4 very quickly, there were two words used towards the end of the whole thing uh, that I didn't want to interrupt the flow to translate. So, very quickly, Dial pretty much just means devil. The other one is Convalis, that was literally said at the end, which just translates into either Raven or uh, Valley. In this case, it would be probably Valley, as um, we're gonna go a bit further through that, so you'll, you'll know. You'll know why it's, why it's more Valley than Ravine. But anyway, let us continue on to 13-4, titled The Mercenary's Day. Careful, the danger never left. So once again, we're gonna go through cutscene to cutscene, no breaks in between. Well, if you don't count the little loading screen. But anyway, let us begin. Honestly, since coming to Victoria, my drafting work has been at a standstill. Back in my mercenary days, I spent most of my free time writing them. One book filled, a new book empty. Really, I had more to write than I physically could. And yet, since joining the military commission, I haven't given those notebooks a flip through in forever by now. I obtained what seemed like a higher position and power, 
I wasn't directing a squad or two of mercenaries any longer. Now they put the sand table of the whole battlefield before me. And I grew more and more sick of what I'd written about. I used to believe the most important test of an archivist's character was loyalty to their accounts. Yet bit by bit, I came to discover these books had turned into echoes of wave after indistinguishable wave, reproductions of scene after scene of the same tragedy. I'd been through this all with my own flesh, felt it all with my own soul. Why even make all this, waken language and empty summary out of it? I'd had enough. When did it happen again? I remember. Last year in September. Last year where the summer was exceptionally long. General, the mayor is dead. Your saber still drips with the blood. If only the blades of the military commission and the mercenaries could be as swift. As long as it's a weapon, there's no real difference. I remember the look he gave me in that moment. But I'm not sure what he really meant by it. Hmm. Roger. News just came from the mercs. The 14 MPs in the plot to assassinate the regent have been apprehended. And what stands are the other MPs taking? They don't have one. I thought you'd be more direct about your methods. If the military commission requires, I can execute every MP straight away. With our current situation, this will suffice. The airship is still under construction. We need just a little extra patience. Pull your men out. The Nazir King's Legion has arrived. The, uh, Legion? My voice shakes a little. The Nazir's Legion. Of all the military powers I'd met in war, the vast majority paled compared to the one named. The difference was heaven and earth. But when? How? Whatever direction a constant army enters Victoria from, they'd have to pass through major duchies. It wouldn't matter how they concealed themselves. The larger force could never... His Majesty has arrived at Londinium suburbs. Two reorganized royal court units directly subordinate to him have been stationed outside the city. <clears throat> I understand. I'll order the mercs to withdraw. That Lieutenant Colonel Letu had his talk with the Regent. He and his defense forces will soon be assuming control over all of Londinium's administrative affairs. On the surface, Londinium will enter a state of semi-martial control led by the defense forces, owing to the garrisoned rebellion. Don't think not of food the Grand Dukes. Their intelligence networks are well developed in the city. They'll definitely start mobilizing for war within the next few months. It won't take that long. It's exceedingly likely the quickest army will show up beneath Londinium's walls within 20 days. But no fear. No matter who arrives first, they won't be hasty to act. Any duke that dares march alone will become the common enemy of all. Just as in the Duke of Windermere's failure of a raid two years ago. The high-speed warships didn't even succeed in launching from the berths before her own men obstructed her. It was ridiculous. The Duke of Windermere. She's clever. She's been warning Parliament since the day the Regent first made contact with Victoria. Cavendish didn't just invite us to enter Londinium of his lonesome. 
Each and every duke was hoping to make a military vassal out of the regent, an assistant to the thorns in their sides. Understand? This duke of Windermere is no exception. Behind the guise of the iron-fisted soldier, she obeys the game logic of aristocrats as much as the rest. She was just the one most impatient to place us back in the toolbox. From what I hear, Victoria's legendary steam knights don't exist anymore. You do have a nose for sniffing, Hoder. Not a good quality for a serviceman. I'm a mercenary general. The region and military commission scheme was a huge success. Pretty crazy. Somehow, the Sarkas have a firm hold on Victoria's capital. The Dukes need an easy-to-cut-up army to put down dissidents, and Parliament is desperate for an appropriate defense to avoid any more action, like those two stupid Dukes adventures. In their eyes, the Sarkas came fresh out of civil war on a silver platter, table ready, disposable. Now, we've taken the industrial sector, leashed parliament, and even the shard will be under our control any day now. The region's taken Londinium for real. But we can't shunt the city off. We can stir up conflict, but then what? We end up buried together with Londinium under a coalition of foreign militaries? What is the commission planning? I know I'm being a little too forward, but you draw suspicion by being too obedient. Yet Manfred doesn't even turn to look at me, his flipping through a book, untitled. Do mercenaries have so many problems, Order? Have I given you too much leeway? I only need to know what the goal I'm serving is. The mercenaries I know have other tastes. Inquiring as to the more loose pocketed employer, or mulling over how to veil a Sancta Caravan. I just have different personal habits. Hmm. Personal habits. The military commission general before me pries his gay away from the book. I hear his position here isn't just for his service rank. I hear his relationship with Theresis is very special. Which means I have to be extra cautious. I dip my head slightly, working to ensure I express enough respect and humility. Is your eye alright? It affects my death perception in sword combat. I'll get used to it ASAP. I've received your interrogation records. The assassin was an Enos woman. A mercenary alike. We sure didn't expect a Sarkas like Enos to get bought out by Parliament, especially for a hit on the Regent. Enos is dead, and you lost an eye for it. You'll receive commendations from the military commission. No commendations necessary. Then you'll receive payment in mercenary fashion. After all, you and Enos, and that lunatic with the W call sign, led an active mercenary unit for quite some time. The old Sarkas of the Scar Market, their commendations for you are blinding. Very decisive of you to kill her. It's the only way a mercenary lives. Will do anything to survive. Even gutting your own colleagues? Even gutting our own colleagues. Then I'm sure one day you'll come to dispatch me. Won't you? <laughs> you asked me just now. What could the military commission be planning? Our plan is only drawn up to the point war breaks out. As for what follows, that would be their plan to make. This place is the heart of hatred, and it will be buried by vengeance. 
just as you wrote in those booklets, just as every war we've been through. So you were. Never mind that. Carry on writing. You've a heavy mission. Bear that responsibility. Now the military commission's duty in Londinium is fulfilled. With a single activation of the shard, the tempest of war will be unstoppable. In which case, what more could Theresis want to do? What more can we do? Done with your notes? No, I wasn't writing anything. Just giving this sword another polish. The mercenary claymore. I haven't used this thing in forever. You're so heartless. If you want it, you can have it. A present from me to you. A sword? No efficiency, zero interest. <sighs> and you found the time to fix your hair? Can't blame you, I guess. We're not going to have the time for hair gel like you did back in Londinium. It's just more convenient this way. You should have kept that outfit. Maybe you could keep acting the Merc leader. Treasurer of the army? <laughs> What's that thing army guys say? It's your calling to serve? A mercenary's calling is to get paid. Not get... bereavement. Knock it off and save your spittle, you two. Defense perimeter, scouting radius. Is this the opening? Until they started fighting, yeah. As for now, they're marching. No matter how much the Dukes hate each other's guts, this front's gonna close in sooner or later. You sure your guy's gonna pass this position? You can literally see these shards' catastrophe clouds from here. The catastrophe's landing point is the line of fire between the Duke of Wellington and the Nachtzerer King. Chances are the Iron Duke will retreat his front. As for Windermere, she probably won't have the spare energy to deploy her own forces until she gets her daughter back inside a nomadic fortress. My guy doesn't have a lot of exit routes from Londinium. Wait, incoming. The shadow's very fast. It's like... A... A polygonal yarn ball? A what? The overall shape is polygonal, but highly irregular. It's arts. High chance the naked eye can't follow it, or else she wouldn't make it here. Target confirmed. We can only afford a little rough play. W. A turn back, and she's gone. A second later, deafening explosions. Uh, after her. The scale of the dust cloaks the entire surroundings, but we're not blind to what's either a sizable witchcraft vehicle or a bizarre aircraft. As ever, W kicks off without restraint. If it did, graze a lich. I brush away the smoke, but surprisingly I feel myself hit something. What is that? A wire? Silk threads, hanging and crisscrossing from the void, then pressing into it again. Mercenaries? What a coincidence. Come at me, then. This is where the strange sensations truly start. Her figure snaps into formlessness in an instant, threats swirling and fading. I trust an arm out with all my strength, but grab at nothing but dust. Did she run? I told you, you can't blow a lich up with bombs. No, she's still around. We have to catch her. Uh, 
Something's not quite right. We never passed by any area like this. Nothing here casts any shadow. Is it an illusion? I think there's a bunch of big guys over there, right by the mountain. Those are some crazy swords. How do they lift them? Mountain? Wasn't this a plane? A fallen where W is looking. The haze gradually thins and the scene becomes clear. A gulp. Practically everything about the battlefield leaves my mind. A Sarkas Traveler starts to speak in an ancient Sarkas language. The Ash Bleach City lies ahead. Let us hasten. It will admit us. The children of the soil and stone have built city walls on sorrow's ground. Kazdel. Each syllable is a bitter journey unto its own. Where is it? From dreams we have departed, seeking to this day. The age of exile has come to an end. What are they saying? It's an ancient Sarkis dialect. Sorrow's ground, Ash Bleach City. I'm having trouble with the rest. I can only guess. I think they mentioned Castel too. Which one? The traveler continues in the ancient Sarkis dialect. Diablo Balorsacha of the Condemned Clan and Quilan, the errant overlord, will meet us on our way. Oh, and he is here too. Guldul, the King of Sarkas. <coughs> I couldn't know these names better. I could almost recite their legends from memory. The first line of Sarkas I ever read was from the tale of these people, the epic transcribed time and time again, still handed down in Kaznal's slums to this day. What these shadows tell us of is the second castle that could be called a city. After the very first castle was laid to waste by the elders and ancients, there passed over a thousand years where castle was no more than a tiny hamlet. A mass of thatch and wooden fencing. Frail, easily destroyed, it was ravaged by the wills of colonizers again and again. And again and again the Sarkas were sent into exile. Until this moment, where the Sarkas had once again accumulated strength, once again rebuilt a true city. They left the wastes that we now call Columbia and came to the heartlands of Terra. And there they lived, and there they died. And then a betrayal, another migration east, and before they'd gone far, the blue flames of fury were again betrayed. It seems as if Sarka's history were cursed from that moment on. History's waves have rolled on to this present day, where citadels are incessantly scrapped and rebuilt and still amble about in arm's reach. But the names they speak, those are the city's first kings of Sarkas. The kings of Sarkas, 7,000 years ago. When did this lich appear before us? How does she have this power? I draw my sword across my chest. The lich lifts a hand. How? How did you produce these things? <clears throat> Considering this castle's historical significance and its impact on the generations to come, the legend of the kings of Sarkas have found such widespread in song. But these vagabonds, even we lack for such trifling um, accounts. This is scarcely even witchcraft, it is absolutely not. No Reginium Arts could attain this degree of effect. Oh, or perhaps it could, but at the very least a historian would be needed. Is it a trick of physics? A projector that forms from images from the mist? When did our brother and sister gain such technology? 
How rude not to share. Hmm. No, it's off. These pictures are too close to the recorded truth. Be the technological feat, from whence came the material? So this is some kind of arts, then. Her hand sways gently in the air, like she's feeling something, studying the colors before her and leaving us to our devices. But it's of no known category of arts. It's highly unlikely even that it isn't arts. How very strange. A Ferran moot? If Victoria wanted to tame a Ferran moot for battle, it should have started long ago. What's this bitch even doing? It seems you are not artists. You are simply and purely the ones who blew up my beloved cube. It was very comfortable sitting in it. Messenger to the Lich Court, Lady Ermengarde, we deeply apologize for using such a method to contact you. I don't know what misconception you have of liches, but honestly, I'm not that old. Stop no towing. I fear this is not your arts either. I certainly don't have the knack to conjure a band of seven millennium old vagabonds. Hmm. What if I use arts to stimulate it? Just the most basic, tiny, tiny amount of energetic irritation. <sighs> A squall whips up. The vision before me recedes like the tide. The twisted scene returns to normality. A bloodied boulder abruptly appears before us all. What is this? I checked this area three days ago. There was nothing like this here. Guys, we... Hey, Hoarder, W, snap out of it! Ines is fine. Thank the stars. My blood is boiling. I've never felt my blood flowing so clearly through my own veins. It surges about like crazy, shooting out through my limbs, then finally converging on my heart again. At Rhode Island, when the medic operators were examining me, they wanted to inject me with, uh, what was it called? I forget. I sure gave them hell about that. I've got the originium. I didn't want more random junk around in my body. Well, fine. I get the message. We need all this blood to live. It carries oxygen and yada yada whatever. Orderer told me once. But right now, I'm sick of it. You're my blood, you little shit, so listen to me. And if not, you can get the hell out of my body. I feel for the dagger on my waist. W? What the hell is wrong with you? Nothing. Just some bloodletting. <sighs> Holder scrunches his brow. The lich is giving her hat a death grip. The record finally dies down. No, actually, I guess we hardy bunch just got used to it. Yes, are you alright? Absolutely nothing's wrong with me. You guys explain. I get it. These rocks don't work on chili old hags. I bet Celtic could dance a whole jig here. I'd believe it. I'd also suggest you bandage that wound. I cut surgical. Avoided the arteries. So, this is an anti sarcas installation? Something to do with the blood? Sarkas, blood, huh, there's a difficult guess. 
This witchcraft device hasn't properly activated yet. Hmm. I drew past this area on the uneasy feeling I had. Here lies the main offender. Little wonder the tutors are always so cautious with matters of Londinium. So what if it does activate for real? All Sulkers explode and die, and then the Sanguinoc throws our blood all over the Victorians? No vehicle tracks in the vicinity. No signs it was transported. They took these giant crystals, crossed all these miles, and then set them down here directly. Somehow, this wouldn't be the first time I've heard of something like that. Lady Ermengarde, I'm guessing you have nothing to do with this either. Naturally. Liches can't accomplish this sort of thing. The space we research isn't this one. Also, if I'm not mistaken, you recognized me just now? Horder, was it? I've had an eye on you on your books before. Some of your manuscripts are even in circulation among Lithanian Sarkas. Do you have any leads for us? Why should I be helping you? You just blew up my little cube. Huh. The bitch just shot a glance at me. Hey, you don't know how much I'm holding back from stuffing a bomb in a chest cavity of yours. Mm hmm. Are all Sarkas mercenaries so eager to die these days? If she says one more word, I'm seriously gonna do it. Forget it. Let's talk about that illusion just now. That was a vestige, a spatial one, a temporal one. Were you looking for vehicle tracks just now? That illusion, was it? Some kind of spatial arts is affecting this place. But that wasn't Originium Arts, and it wasn't Sarkas Witchcraft. These art circles are related to the vampires, and the illusion was definitely related to the art circles, but there is no direct line connecting them. Perhaps these are leads you can use? What position are the liches taking? The same as ever. We've made no promises. But we have an informant telling us Kazdal has had liches showing up too. You usually never make appearances in Kazdal. Oh? You left Babel, joined an infected organization, then ended up in Londinium, and you've still kept an intelligence net up in Kazdal? Are you really just a mercenary? I feel like with your com competences, you could get hooked up as a Gazetsvechter in Lethanian, relatively speaking. Oh, except your arts is a little mediocre. Personal habits. Mm-hmm. Personal habits. In a battlefield this extensive, how do you think you'd stop me if I did want to leave the Vala Whisper? You were looking for us too? Technically, I'm a little interested in you. Specifically you. Do you Sarkas always have to talk in riddles? Score one interruption from Enos. She's getting impatient. Nice. Let her draw everyone's attention while I kill this son of a lich dead. Given you get news from Kazdal, that naturally means our siblings' acts just been feigning ignorance. We need... hmm... to give Theresa some flex room. We're taking control of Castle right now. Everyone's come to Victoria, so someone's got to look after the place. What flex room? Are you gonna hold a celebratory feast? Yes, that's the first part of the plan. Then we declare National Foundation Day, and so on. <coughs> no more jokes now. That is just the first part of the plan. Theresa and Theresa have no plans for evacuating and all. It seems they really do want Londinium to be the battlefield for a face-off against all the lands. We have no idea what's giving them so much confidence, but if it's their plan, brother and sister, then they must have some means in place already. So, if they do succeed, then that means we'll have to rebuild Kazdal, rebuild the Sarkas's haven. And if they fail... If the Sarkas fail here, 
then we'll lose an entire generation of youth, and maybe every youth that was to come. After the expedition of 200 years ago, most nations had no clue about the present state of Kazdal. They weren't even interested. Until all this, a lot of Victorian worthies believed Kazdal was just a pile of ruins. But before the Civil War, with Her Highness Theresa's establishment, Kazdal had a nascent nomadic city. I oh, know Theresa's messed the whole thing up. Now Kazdal's just this super giant witchcraft tractor. That kind that's got bolts and parts popping off it while it trots along. Gazel wouldn't stand up to anything you could call a war, but the region just so happens to be starting one. Once it begins, every spy will have made contact with Kazdal. How will those nations sitting on the fence regard the Sarkas within the territory? Alright, you're a pessimist. Good. So am I. So, part two of the plan. The liches hanging back in Kazdal have formulated the plans to break the place up. If Theresa's fails, Kazdal will immediately be split into pieces, made a dozen or more, maybe a dozen or more, taking their affiliated residents, as per the appropriated um, clan units, off to hide deep in the barrens. Brute planning, balanced production, and ensuring Kazdal becomes a nomadic city isn't without meaning. To the Sarkas, the enmity of the rest of the mankind is a catastrophe. Kazdal will greet another age of exile. Again with the exile. What kind of crap is this? As if we're not exiles already, did I miss some nomadic city where we all live happy lives, sipping afternoon tea, watching the catastrophe clouds roll by? Hmm. The Sarkas are strongly united at this point. Not at all the way I hoped, but purely in terms of endpoint. Theresis has done it. But, an, but unity could mean more than just another vengeful massacre. Despite that unity being founded on hatred and war, that's no easy ask, Holderer, my brother. <sighs> Castle is more than a city. It's every person who calls it home. In the original plan, Castle didn't need that many inhabitants. And they wouldn't let us take that many away anyway. We have to end this war in Victoria. The sooner, the better. If we can't take back hate, then, the, then, the, then at least we can do is turn it to fuel to cast the supports of Kazdal. And every life to the Kazdal of the future may well be vital. Easily set for you. We just touched on a method for moving supplies and people over long distances. That might be what we've been after this whole time. What serves as the military commission's lifeline in Londinium? I'll find it and seize it. It was able to bring us to Londinium, so it can take us home too. Before everyone's buried six feet under. Hmm. I... You aren't certain to succeed. You're just a mercenary. A place to call home. Somewhere you can always return to. <laughs> Theresa. All this time I've been trying to keep that name separate from this war. Her Highness. How can a war just like before let anyone rest in peace? I bet it's just some diversion by that Theresa's bastard. He killed her highness, and he's still blaspheming her. I'll make him beg forgiveness on his hands and knees. And once he's done, then I'll turn his skull into fireworks. Finding you was the right choice. I'll take your plans as the stance of Babel survivors and inform the liches. Thank you. But you blew up my cube! How do you want me to get back on foot? 8 kilometers northwest, there's a circus transport camp. Go and steal their car. Need us to help? Forget it. I don't want her catching me again and finding out I've been making deals with you on the sly. So, good luck to you, and may you still be alive to make good on your promise after meeting her. 
Her? Hold on. Are you guys getting this familiar feeling? What are you talking about? What am I talking about? I have no idea. Damn it, Hordera should be the one saying moody crap like this. But still, what's bugging me? Not far off, there's someone sitting on a mountain peak, just on the edge of where that Originium illusion vanished. She's just sitting there, like she doesn't have a care in her heart. Her long pink hair draped over her shoulders, as it always was. And that look in her eyes, that sorrowful. I look away. How is this happening? How? 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 No, that's no illusion. The moment I saw her, I knew it wasn't. That's her. Your Highness? She's gone. I want to reach out to... No, forget it. Maybe I should have... Should save it for next time. Besides, she couldn't have been real anyway. She just really, really looked like her. An indistinguishable forgery. Able to fool almost any pair of screwy, messed up eyeballs. Alright, with those scenes out of the way, oh boy. They are definitely making making friends in places and meeting certain interesting people in the distance. But we are gonna move on now to 13-5. Titled Anguish Hangs Or. Fate twists in an instant. Seize the opportunity. Alright, alright, and like last time we're gonna go over the cutscenes together put together and then once we're done we're gonna do the little miscellaneous stuff including the little booklet so let's begin with the scenes the fog grows thicker the entire forest seems to swim in it I'll confess, I'm not so familiar with Kazdal at all. By the end of the Banshees' court spar in the war 200 years ago, I was gone from that city. It was in the Convalis of the Banshees I came of age. I had asked my mother why, being one of our six heroes, she would choose to leave Kazdal, the city she once fought to the bitter end for. My mother issued no response at the time. She plucked a few reeds from the riverbank and wove a necklace for me. Their stems twisted about each other, head to tail, tail to head. It was beautiful, and I treasured it in the most genuine sense. Yet very soon, it withered and faded, and fell to scattered pieces. My mother told me how this was the Banshee's most traditional art form. We weave song an incantation, just as we weave necklaces of grass. But now we had the entire Convalis. They needed not be foraged, needed not be bothered, and so year after year they grew forever. We banshees sang our elegies, but the elegies were no supplication of the end, rather they were anticipations of new life. There is the Sarkas's need not to hold a dead city standing, but to grow.
This is a highly disconcerting environment, Doctor. We were in the thick of a forest only moments ago. What lay before us became nothing alike as the fog settled in. A convalis. And yes, not to detract very quickly before we continue, that is the Doctor, and we are indeed gonna be observing the Doctor for the rest of this cutscene from an actual third-person perspective, instead of the usual first-person perspective that we get from the Doctor. <clears throat> is this an illusion, Logos? The Doctor is considerably wounded, but her tone of voice is steadied once more. Ascalon silently carries the still unconscious Amia, taking the very front. She remains as ever, lips sealed, but I can sense that her current silence is a more bleak one than before. I remember, at the time of her hurried rendezvous with me, that flicker of an expression I found hard to discern. Mirages are spin from nothingness. Their scenes are mere fictions in the mind, bound to return to nihil no matter how lifelike. But this place is not. Everything here truly did exist, once upon a time. Constructing a mirage like this requires not just intelligence and information, but time and space. It's too difficult. A bone whistle? I know this Gwanvalis. I've always loved it. Yes, the whistle of the Banshees. It doesn't necessarily entail Originium Arts. When we were young, we'd learn it by the riverside. We'd sit among the underbush and wait still. Until Great Finn gobbled small bug, until Fowl Bees snatched up Great Finn. That is when the bone whistle is played. What's the scenery doing here? How do we get out? I'm trying. Originium Arts has this power. The power this is of can only be something more ancient. But it shouldn't come about in this battlefield at this moment. Not on Londinium's periphery. Everything we're seeing and hearing could pass for real. Our squad is not in good condition. We need to up our vigilance. At the Convalis's other end, there seems to stand someone. Dead still. Silent. Mother. Logos, what's wrong? Nothing. I say try to tear this landscape apart directly. It carries some risk, but it's the best solution. I don't know whether it'd be safe to leave this place, Ascalon. Ascalon nods, handing Ami over to the doctor, who strains to hold her up, but the arm that isn't hurt. Ascalon, Master Assassin, vanishes in a blink into the mist. I shut my eyes and prepare, conceiving of destruction, imagining reconstruction. But the figure appears again, this time atop one of the Convalis's crests. She seems to be looking at me, but she is as if a thin slice of the past, stuck frozen in some older time. I know that crest full well. When I was young, I would practice incanting there, until twilight fell and she would show up behind me. I would never know when exactly she had come, but she would just stand there as she does now in this mirage. And once I exhausted myself, we would go home together. I feel for my bone vessel. It's cold as bale ice, just like the time I was first given it. 
Not long ago, I sounded it to the closure of the Matsi's court. But the time before that, that was back in this Convalis. Flashback. I'll be leaving tomorrow for Babel. Yes. You're master of your Legaic court now. Remember to send Her Highness Theresa my greetings. It still doesn't feel real to me, mother. I'm too young to be master of a royal court. Now, now, what makes you say that? Anyone could see how remarkable you are. Keep this safe. Oh. Your bone whistle. I've tuned it for you and given it a royal court crest. And of course, a kiss full of magic too. Alright. Simply sound it, and all the Sarkas will know it as the will of the Nell. <laughs> Mother, what should a lord of the Banshees do? Do what you believe you must. I once talked to you about those ravings of mine. The feathered Sarkas have no escape just as the necklaces you used to weave together for me became naught but pieces in the end. Yet what fetters us is our identity to what we belong. The royal court and perhaps the king of Sarkas. <laughs> but still you bestow this aspect on me. Our rotting bones will never again be given new life should annihilation reach its destination. And yet, that is the rule. We sound a knell for all, for others, for ourselves. But it is a necessary burden. If you feel our time war inheritance has been reduced to naught, but a stepping stone to new life, then it is for you to ascertain that yourself. Supposing that does not change your mind. Then from death comes new life. I rest the whistle to my lips. <sighs> my, my. Now, well done. Oh, tender little lord of the banshees, for whom does your first fledgling knell toll? For myself. For the royal court that would rot, past and future all. Hmm. The sarcasm must write a new verse. What meaning is there in a stagnant landscape? With the words, power bursts forth. This is... The Vampire's Witchcraft. But a vampire could never construct the landscape we were just in. I fear there's some other presence helping him. What is the vampire planning to do with these art circles? Laboring to keep Amia supported, the doctor lifts their head with some worry, taking in the giant sanguine colored crystals. The loop here isn't even complete, but some of its symbols are legible. Purify. It's trying to affect our blood somehow. Affect Sarka's blood. This artistry is tied to the Sarka's power. The doctor gives no response, seemingly lost in thought. Hey! Huh. They finally ran out of patience. 
I detected them long ago. A handful of boorish wanderers. The dearrangement of our space-time was masking their figures. And now, with the mist abated, they finally showed themselves. Already, the silver glint in Ascalon's hand has cut across their necks, while bone-writ incantation blocks their attack. A clump of dirt. It's crude as a child would be. <laughs> uh, wait! I told you they were real! Those ghosts were the real deal! Ah, uh, it is a child. Is that you? Does the doctor know this Sarkas girl? Uh... You're not a doctor, right? I saw you once in the munitions factory in Highbury. What are you doing here? And the... Knocked out Cautus and the... Uh, Sarkas? You were supplying goods to refugees in Norpor. How did you know that? I, I, don't let it slip. I was just... Uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't... Uh, I don't think that Cotus girl is looking too good, is she? Uh, and your arm is all... I am... Um, I'm gonna guess you guys are fine hanging out with these Sarkas? I think we ended up where we came... But did we do it for real this time? I bet enough hallowed monsters things for one day. This is out of whack. Paprika, what are you talking to the ghosts for? One in a hood, one unconscious bunny and a sarcas? Uh, no, driver, they're real. As in real? This sarcas steps up to me, skeptically looking me up and down. I can tell with a glance that she's never taken the battlefield. Her hands uh, had calluses in the wrong places. Just now, did the young paprika girl call her driver? Hello. Uh, Miner, come and check this out, it's real! Your, your, your clothes must have cost some money, didn't they? Uh, maybe take a closer look. Uh, no, never mind. Trust your horse's bumpkins not to know. Good of the oh, I'm from Castle already, shopkeep. Like you matter. All you do there is run a grocery store. Oh, wait. Forgot. You sold your store so you could pick up uh, fights out here. <laughs> Shape up a little. Stop getting carried away in front of people. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you may have met me in Castle before. My grocery store was a fairly popular one. The man nicknamed Shopkeeps rub, rubs his hands, eyeing me with ingrati ingratiation. His dagger is equipped with an auxiliary Reginium Arts control apparatus. Never an affordable piece of kit. A shame it's all new, dagger itself included. You must be part of the royal court, yes? I can tell by your regalia. I take it you're the, uh, child of soil and stone? Hmm. So he hasn't the first clue about any court at all. I am the Banshee. A boy Banshee? I thought Banshees were meant to be all girls. Correct. Huh, never heard about any boy Banshee while I was in Casimir's. Ah, uh, not that I mean to be impolite or, uh, you know. Uh, Paprika, you're friends with celebrities like him and you never told us? Um, no, I don't know if we know each other. Are you moving things? Inside their truck, I notice an uncovered spot, where a few blood-streaked crystals are poking out. Where are you transporting these goods to? Aren't these ritual materials? Um, I don't really know how to explain. We're just patrolling along our route map. Cause some art circles might be a little damaged and we need to repair them. The doctor makes brief eye contact with me. 
I have some inkling. A Sarkas truck, a vehicle that can take us through the battlefield. With Amia's current condition, we won't be rendezvousing with the main unit on foot. I can sense Ascalon all set to go in the shadows, ready to strike at the amateur squad before us. But evidently, the doctor already has a better idea. A noble banshee, sire, we won't cross the battlefield alive at this rate. I beg you, just let us go. Hmm. I can comprehend the doctor's gist, but I'm really not well versed when it comes to this. Hmm. I commandeer your transport squadron. We are on a special mission of the utmost nature, but we're but we're assailed en route. For your assistance, I will memorialize your forevermore. Uh, <laughs> it'd be our honor to serve a member of the royal court, your highness. It's just being memorialized by a deaf tolling banshee doesn't seem like much of a fortune. Uh, could you, um... Here is your payment. Thank you, coins that Machinist stuffed in my bag. <laughs> Thank you, sire. But our transport duty... I'll explain to your superiors afterwards. A special mission? Why bring these two outbloods along? They are my captives. Captives? But you, um... Hmm. Okay, but once this is over, you guys are gonna come and see General Manfred with me. For now, we'll go sort out some positions. The doctor comes to my side, voice grave. Logos, figure out a car for Ascalon too. The Confessari attack was no simple one. They and the Vampire were working together, but in the process they estranged Amia from the ship. Doctor, are you worrying? Closure and the Self-Salvation Corps troops don't have any suitable combat personnel between them. Consid's wounded, Shining's powerful, but the Confessari are sure to have methods prepared just for her. I understand. The state Amia is in may not be curable with medication. What she needs most right now before she comes to is not to fall into the Confessari's line of sight. Operating under this squad's support will be safer. I'll get Ascalon to back up concert. We've got you here. Besides... The doctor looks at the sanguine art circles. A pit forms in their stomach. Say no more. I know far too well. These crystals aren't just simply simple originium. Do you know what the cruelest thing in the world is? Neither total darkness, nor endless torment, nor a dark alley filled with murderers. It is when a gentle hand pulls you out of a nightmare, just as you thought it was over, and all the pain would come to an end. Only for you to realize that salvation was just a cruel joke, a brief respite before falling further into the darkness. Even greater suffering is gazing upon you, within a stone's throw and you were powerless before such mockery. Delphine, do you want to join us? The Duke of Windermere's coffin is being transported to the approaching battleships. Some of the refugees have taken it upon themselves to organize a funeral procession in their gratitude. She keeps looking at the place where her mother had fallen, even though any trace of blood is long gone. It may not be a good idea to invite her now. I'm already starting to regret it. Can you thank them for me, Vina? I want to stay here a while longer. 
What did they say to you? Nothing. I'll just stay for a little longer and cool my head. The sword guards boarded the late arriving escort fleet. Most of them kept silent while the nobles panicked. A moment's weakness when I tried to help that soldier. The vampire reached out his hand, whether it was an obvious trap or not. Mother was wounded because of it. Broken formation and fallen soldiers. Sword guards do not defend their duke. Their only goal is to fulfill their mission. But they faced a foe powerful beyond their, their imagination. <laughs> Delphine. The staff officers think there was too much personal sentiment in this reckless operation. They never supported it. They must believe that I'm the reason Mother died. A hero should not die for the weak. And they're right. <laughs> I gaze at the late arriving battleships, their standards flying high. For some reason, I'm reminded of Ellerdale. I've cleaned your wounds as best as I can, Lady Delphine. This is all I can do with the limited amount of medicine available. Thank you, Doctor. I must go. The General Staff have ordered all troops to report back. I've left behind some things that belong to you. These were the Duke's gifts to you. And you have her sword. This may sound impudent, but I hope that you will come back to Ironclad Galeev with us. Whatever the senior officers say, nothing can change the fact that you are the heir to the title of Duke Windermere. <laughs> I'll think about it. Right now, I just want some quiet. How are things? They took a bunch of people, but many more remain. So that rough mom really... Yes. Ironic, isn't it? The Duke has trained her officers well. Even now, the General Staff of Windermere continue to plot the next course of action, according to the plan. But... What about Delphine? It seems like these snobbish officers are planning to abandon her. I don't know. I'm even worried what they might do to Delphine as their heir. Heir. She... She's not ready. Duke Windermere was a strong leader. Her sword guards, her general staff, they all served the greater good of Victoria alone. But she herself... She made an admir admirable but reckless decision for the sake of her daughter. That decision saved a bunch of lives, though, de didn't it? I'm not criticizing her. I respect her. But it means that Delphine is being abandoned by what her mother, Duke Windermere, built on her own. Oh. What do we do now? They took some of the refugees. Can we really trust them? Do we follow the tales of the nobles in the coming battle? They didn't take everyone? That's not right. If this... One ship could take everyone. There's no reason that so many battleships couldn't... What's that movement? I thought the ship's engines were out. The window! Dust rises from the escort fleet that has only just rendezvoused with us. They're sailing away. Delphine! She stands on the deck where her mother left this world, holding her mother's sword in her arms, as she did before I went below. The wind sweeps at her short hair. Her solitude makes her look even smaller than she is. What's going on? I grab her shoulder. Only then does she come out of her stupor. I see... None of the anger, fear, or sorrow that I expected to see. She's wearing barely any emotion at all. Only calm, flat disappointment. And a quiet so deep it is painful to see. They're gone. 
Her voice trembles a little. But it's still too calm. There are civilians down below waiting to see the Duke of Windermere is coughing off. Those bastards didn't mind running innocent people over? What's going on? That wasn't part of the orders. Maybe there was a miscommunication. Uh, we still have a few good IFWs. We need to head back to Arnkar Galeva and get confirmation. <laughs> I've never gazed upon the tail of the battleship so intently. How ridiculous. The marks that the rain of blood left on our clothes is a lingering reminder of that cruel attack. Several hours have passed since we left the Duke of Windermere's flagship. Bad news keeps coming. We did a headcount as we left the ship. The Doctor, Ami and Ascalon were not there. We only had time to do a brief search, which came up empty. All I can do is keep faith in their strength, but for some reason I think back to Amia's lean shoulders. Sorrow and helplessness are luxuries that this group can no longer afford. Stop dawdling! I... I really can't go any further. I'll whip you if I have to! Get up! Stay with the armor if you want to live! I... I need to catch my breath, sir. I... have a condition... <laughs> no dawdling. This isn't just about your life. Hands off, Norpo Hoodlum. I'm just carrying out my orders. They're not trained soldiers. They've been at a forced march for five straight hours. They don't have any strength left. Then they can lie down and die. We're trying to save their lives. Everything can still be salvaged if we make it back to Ironclad Glaive. They need to stop and rest. I said! It's not just for them. It's for you too, Ensign. I know your condition. Not many soldiers were left behind, but I know almost all of you are infected. Shut up! I'll let that slide. This once. You're Duke Windermere's man. Do not let your actions defile her memory. I... <sighs> Infection. A curse they fear more than any other. Catch up to the ship that abandoned them. Hide the growing black crystals under the bandage. Fool yourself. I'm sorry. It's just... Don't say that blasted word. I'm fine. I'm fine. I said to keep a low profile on the barons and avoid drawing Sarka's attention. Sir, I... It's getting dark. The civilians trying to keep up with you need to rest, Lieutenant. No, we continue the march as planned. We can reach Hill 31 by midnight at our current pace. We'll re-establish communications with Arankar Galeath there. Only once we're in touch with the nomadic fortress are we truly safe. If we wait until morning, I doubt this group is ready to face the Sarkas and... You're the ranking officer and the de facto commander here, and the ship's doctor. You know as well as I do that we're trying to catch a fast battleship with our own feet and a few tanks. I respect your decision, Lieutenant, but we don't even know why those battleships left. If they didn't respond to your hails at the time, why do you think the fortress will open its gates to us? I checked on the group. We have less than three companies of combat effective soldiers and nearly a thousand refugees following in tow. By the time the march that you had in mind is done, there will be less than 20% left. Vina, right? Listen. He avoids my gaze. I mean 20% of your soldiers. And none of the refugees. Sir! He begins to whisper. I need not hear what they're saying. I saw what happened. Someone bled his last in the long, silent wall of people. He left behind a long trail of blood mixed in with the mud. The lieutenant's silence hardly lasts two breaths. Slow down a little. We'll keep going. Idiot. 
My fist leaves its mark on his face. I heard a crisp sound. I think I dislocated his jaw. Ah! Ah! He quickly puts his jaw back in place. Must have dealt with this sort of thing a lot. You assaulted a soldier hooligan! I could have you executed according to Victorian service law. You! Stand up! You could try to execute me, or we can keep going. The fist is a solution that can only be used once in a while. Dagda, Morgan and Indra stand in front of the soldiers on edge. The civilians surround us silently. It reminds me of how we used to fight turf wars on the streets. Stand down! Do not open fire! <laughs> they called you Siege, didn't they? They were telling stories that you were actually highborn or something. And with that accent... I'm a hooligan, leader of the Glasgow gang. Fine, I don't care. Listen, I'm a soldier who has pledged his loyalty to the Duke of Windermere. My duty is to fulfill the mission handed down by my commander. I'm waiting for you to wipe the blood from your mouth. Give up, your elbow is about to dislocate. Some sacrifices are acceptable in order to protect m the many. And just who are the many? Have you taken a look at who you're leading? I am. Frightened soldiers, silent civilians, the infected, the wounded. The people standing around us. <laughs> I've had enough. I want to tell them. Those who escaped hell in Norpor. I'm still looking out for them. There's still someone who cares about them. Might makes right. Law of the streets, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'm telling you now that they are going to make camp here. And they're going to rest. We must reconsider our course of action. If we're cut off from the main force at Arnkel Galay, if everyone is going to die, when we run into the Sarkas. Every last one. Enough. Don't insult the memory of the Duke of Windermere anymore, Lieutenant Shear. If you still think you're part of her army. How could you? Delphine clutches the hilt of her sword. It surprises me, even more than it surprises Lieutenant Shearer. He's surprised and angry. I'm suddenly reminded that he had provided medical aid to everyone on the ship before Iron Calgalave abandoned us. Delphine, your clothes and the sword. A little big for me, is it? But I need you all to hear me out. Is the lieutenant leaving? Yes, they formed a small squad and picked the tank in best condition. He can leave at any time. That squad will travel light and quick. They can reach the marked location before dawn. You put those clothes on. Maybe what they represent will still remains something to someone. I have spoken to my troops, Lady Delphine. They will follow your orders until I return. For the last time, my lady, you're the heir to Windermere. No matter what happens, you should come with us. Sorry, but I must stay. This was my promise to the people. They need to know that Victor Victoria has not abandoned them. They need this hope to keep going. We can only trust each other now. We must trust each other. If the departure of the escorts was just a misunderstanding or a mutiny by a few, then Arklan Galave will welcome us, whether I'm there or not. And if not... The lieutenant's eyelid twitches. Delphine's words are certainly subversive. My presence will only make things worse. At least, you'll live. My lady, it's not my own hide that I'm concerned. They let me go the first time, perhaps out of respect for my mother, perhaps out of a sense of pity. But they won't give me a second chance. <laughs> 
I trust my comrades and the officer's loyalty to the Duke. Please take this location beacon, Lady Delphine. I promise to bring back good news. As for you... The man gazes calmly at me. I clench my fist, preparing for a sucker punch. You've got some hard knuckles. Take care of Lady Delphine. Cheers, Lieutenant. Siege, we checked up on the refugees from Norport. Perhaps the Duke of Windermere had given orders behind our backs. Things were chaotic when we boarded the ship, and we couldn't find the one who executed the order. Regardless, their screening was impeccable. There is no sign of infection among the refugees in the group. But now... I look in the direction where the lieutenant departed. Of course. Many soldiers who fought amidst Sarka's witchcraft are showing acute infection symptoms. These soldiers got a rip of fighting the Sarkas. How could their comrades just abandon them like that? It's an old military tradition, and not a strictly Victorian one. It's the same in Casimir's Ursus Gaul. The infected are not allowed in camps. More conscientious commanders might put the infected in their own unit and send them on the most dangerous missions. But for the military, there's far too much uncertainty in the infected and their uncontrol uncontrolled arts. Some must have resisted. No one ever succeeded. Looking back on history, the infected make up a relatively small portion of armies in times of war. Acceptable losses in exchange for stability on the front lines. It's even in the textbooks of the Royal Military Academy. It's just... The honorable martyrs who died for the glorious foundation. No, no, no need to get violent, ladies. I'm here to talk. First, let me make clear that the death of Her Grace, Duke Windermere, has nothing to do with the part of Victoria that I serve. In fact, I bring my sincerest condolences, Lady Delphine. My own position aside, I believe she glowed brighter than any hero in the Battle of the Four Emperors. But now, we'll fill the gap that her death leaves behind. Who can step up to take her place in the Grand Strategic Theater? Duke Wellington is an accomplished soldier, but we all know he has no intention of giving, giving his all. Duke Castor has her hands full coordinating everything. Frankly, the death of Duke Windermere is a... Big, big problem. You sure got the news quickly, didn't you? Well, it's my business to know. You'd be familiar with our line of work. What are you here for? I suggest you think carefully about the next words coming out of your mouth. Hmm. Flowers for the hero, Lady Windermere, and a gift of rations and ammunition. In exchange for? You know full well, your royal highness. The scrap of metal known as the size of kings. To be honest, I have no use for this sword personally. You want to trade? Sure. My conditions are simple. Take the damnable stone of the sword of yours and bring it to the front lines, where the storm blows the fiercest, where the fire falls the hardest. <laughs> you can get lost if your plan is to keep the sword safely in the rear, to prop up a tent for kings and nobles to drink tea beneath. If you really will bring this thing to the lines and provide shelter for Victorian warrior citizens and the poor souls who have lost their homes, if it is a shelter for all, whether the son of a blacksmith or the daughter of a teacher, whether they take pity in the name of Victoria or carry weapons of their own making, then by all means you can have this piece of metal. Come to me with the stone of the sword, Trilby Asher. I promise that I will never fall behind you on the front lines, not by a single step. Oh my. This is beyond my discretion. 
I'm just an envoy after all. Her grace, the Duke of Castor, has the final decision. Then go to your master. Come back to me once you have an answer for my dear aunt. I'll do my best, your royal highness, Alexandrina. But this is just a promise on a personal level. What follows now is off the record. Some personal opinions, not of Trilby Asher, but of Sir Suffolk Bellingham. A new voice is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> You've taken the infected soldiers, well, and many more civilians, but the point stands. That's all good and fine, but it's not enough. You need an army. Your own army. An army with a place for them. You... I'm surprised. Perhaps it's a caster trick. But he is encouraging me to form my own reunion. Looks like you really did turn off your sound recorder. Can't do it for too long. Colleagues are getting suspicious, you know. My grandmother was executed after getting infected in the War of the Four Nations. When she left, she told me with a laugh that there was less than a 3% chance of getting a Ripathy in battle. It was only when I inherited the title and looked through the records in the archives that I learned. The 3% figure has been in use for centuries. It has never changed. Even though we're using more Eugenium machines and more complex Eugenium arts in modern warfare. Perhaps you haven't noticed because all you can see is a small corner of the battlefield. Certain the Dukes haven't noticed because they have their sights set way too far away. But I have. The infected problem in the Victorian army is serious. Serious on an unprecedented scale. Everyone exercises restraint in a conflict between civilized nations. No one wants their camp to be filled with ticking, living time bombs, or sees a dirty city covered in originium dust. But now, our enemy is the Sarkas. If you really mean to do this siege, that it has the potential to be a good thing for your reputation, for my career, perhaps even for our country. Thanks for the concern, but my friends and I know how the infected know the infected better than you do. We'll be fine. Very well. Oh, by the way, I have some scrap equipment here that nobody wants or cares about. Leftovers, you know. You can have them. It's all trash, after all. Farewell, then. How much do you believe him? I would rather believe that even someone like him could not stay out of this conflict. What did he leave behind? A uh, recording? And coordinates? The sound. Need support. Callaway. Surrounded. Tempest platoon. Requesting aid. Well then. That was Mama Logos. Hot damn. Anyway, before we move on, we have several new enemies here to introduce. So let's go... Let's go backwards. Starting from this stage, we have the Sarkas Hair Bear Bombardier. And it says, A long-range bombardier of the Sarkas Royal Court that has received the blessing of the Sanguine Arc of Vampires. Wherever they aim will be left a sea of flames. And their targets inevitably reduce to rubble. On the stage before that, on 13.4, we had the Sarkas Air Bear Punisher. A formation breaker of the Sarkas Royal Court that has received the blessing of the Sanguine Arc of Vampires. Said to have violated the, tab the taboos of the court, however, the Sanguine Arc did not punish them for their transgressions. Instead, they now inflict upon others the pain that should have befallen them. 
Lovely. And then on 13.3 we had the Engorged Hair. A creation of the Sanguine Arc of Vampires is Originium Art. Though their bodies are already engorged with the blood of others, their thirst never ceases. So pretty much this is the... This is the fed form of a worm that we have already fought all the way back. By the way, I was I, I completely misremembered which chapter it was where the Sanguine Arc enemies were. It was all the way back in chapter 10! <clears throat> Sorry. That was a while ago. But, anyway, we are now gonna hop on into this little thing. And now, for maybe people who have fo followed along with this narration without actually seeing this uh, at any given point, so blindly, this is the very reason why I didn't want to open this one up before. I did click on this thing, and I kind of wish this thing would have been locked <laughs> until you beat 13-3, cause, uh, I mean, just look at it. The Happy Windermere family. Dad, me, Mom. Covered in blood. Yay. I saw that before I started reading and I was like, oh boy. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> says here on the bottom, Postcards from all over Terra, preserved for many years. What the fiends been collecting since childhood. A record of the three-person household's happy days of yore, now given to you by Delphine herself to be sealed away. Bygones are bygones, I don't mind you taking a peek, of course. So then, our first one comes from 13.5, and obviously when you complete it on the highest difficulty, you get all the rewards in one go. God, she sounds so sad. I mean, understandable, but oh boy. Well then, welcome on board. So then, and of course, like always, we will get... Oh, this is a very short entry compared to... Compared to the usual. So let's see. Customized for visitors. And family... Aphelies? Remember Delphine's expression when she got the violin? I should have gotten that unforgettable pout on camera. Anyway, since I'm already here in Heidenschwil, I ought to pick her a uniquely, uniquely Lithanian gift from your friend's recommendations. I'll give her another present to make up for it when I'm back in Windermere. Signed, Kent. So from her dad. Oh boy, this is gonna be heartbreaking going through these, isn't it? And what do, we do, what do we get from the postcard? I remember, she was adorable. Signed, Anne. Dad, I like my present. I'm just upset because Mom was too late to take pictures. Business uh, held me up. I'll be careful next time, Mom. Oh, this is gonna be heartbreaking. <laughs> this is gonna be heartbreaking, every single one of these, huh? Oh boy! <clears throat> oh boy! Uh, anyway, <laughs> this is where we're gonna end off. As a tiny little bonus, again for people who are mostly following around blindly, first and foremost, here in our first background, uh, we have the little, or uh, the, the big chunks of uh, both red crystal and uh, the stone that we saw in those scenes with several of our characters at this point encountering the Sanguine Arc's witchcraft. But if we scoot on over a bit to the right, well, that is a background. That is a very familiar looking skeleton in the background of something. It's like I've seen it before. It's like it was there. For a long, long time. Staring me in the face. Isn't it? <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, this is where we're gonna leave off. So, next time we're obviously gonna continue from 13.6. And we'll see how far we can get with all of the stuff. But, things be happening. And it'd be very interesting. I do... 
wanna see and I'm looking forward to how this is gonna go and damn this is gonna be a chapter but yeah thank you very much guys for watching hopefully you enjoyed this uh, with this tiny little actually blind reaction to uh, the postcard thing technically blind considering I haven't read that before uh, but yeah hope you enjoyed if you did please consider leaving a like because uh, that would help me out a lot and mean a lot, of course. So thank you very much. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing, of course. And if you want to help me out a bit more, there are memberships on the channel. And as always, there will be no video behind a membership. It's literally just there to uh, support me more directly. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the members who are already using uh, the memberships. And uh, yeah, I will see you in the next part. Hopefully you have a fantastic day wherever you are. And uh, yeah. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.